study and correlation of three phases of universe reality, origin, history, and destiny. The proper understanding of these three experiential realities affords the basis for a wise estimate of the current status. And I believe when we look at education, and hopefully we'll gain some insight by looking at it, beginning with the previous epical revelations, the planetary prince, Adam and Eve, Melchizedek, and Jesus. Our first kind of information about what happened was about 500,000 years ago, and that was in the educational mission of the Calagastia, the planetary prince of Eurasia. FAD, the head of the Dissemination and Conservation of Knowledge Council, sponsored a Dalmatia plan of teaching that was carried out as an industrial school in which the pupils learned by doing and through which they worked their way by the daily performance of useful tasks. This plan of education did not ignore thinking and feeling in the development of character. And we'll find that, that those statements are very similar to what happened in some of those earlier revelations. And pattern always gives us a way of, you know, hooking on to the fact that we're going to be talking a bit about learning by doing, thinking, feeling, and character development, which is really part of each of the four earlier revelations. So the second was the educational mission of Adam and Eve, which was approximately 40,000 years ago, and things had progressed quite a bit. And the garden schools of Adam and Eve were located both east and west of the garden. The East Garden focused on the intellectual training of their children using the methods of the Jerusalem schools. The entire purpose of the Western school system was socialization. It was devoted mainly to practical horticulture and agriculture, competitive play, social intercourse, and friendship. Section 7, Life in the Garden, of paper 74, Adam and Eve, contains more specific information about the intellectual and cultural teachings in their schools, including health and sanitation, the golden rule, individual and group rights, history and culture, world trade, and social regulation. Quite uh, quite a school system that set two parts of the garden, one for intellect and the second part of it more for practical nature and competitive play. Social was always important in the earlier re revelations as well. The third is the educational mission of Melchizedek. That was approximately 4,000 years ago. Melchizedek was locally known as Prince of Salem because he presided over a small colony of truth seekers and he fostered the truth of his day so that it could be safely passed on to Abraham and his associates. And thus did Melchizedek prepare the way and set the monotheistic stage of world tendency for the bestowal of an actual paradise son of the one God whom he so vividly portrayed as the father of all, and who he represented to Abraham as a god. In some ways, Melchizedek was really kind of like a trans transition um, revelation. And because we see it changes a little bit from what was happening on a larger scale, his job was really to work with a small group of truth seekers for that transitional role that he was to play in making sure that the light of God was not distinguished. And of course the fourth, probably the most common of all, is Jesus' education. I use this quote, and David actually used it quite a bit too, because it's one of the few quotes that kind of gives you a process about, about learning. As a child, he accumulated a vast body of knowledge. As a youth, he sorted, classified, and correlated this information. And now, as a man of the realm, he begins to organize these mental propositions preparatory to utilization 
in his subsequent teaching ministry and service. So you kind of see, it's not really a hierarchy, very, but it is a way of looking at how important knowledge is, how important wisdom is in preparation for ministry and service and his subsequent teachings. His mission, um, approximately 2,000 years ago, it, where he says, education is the business of living, which was exemplified so perfectly in the life of Jesus of Nazareth, son of God and son of man. So we have a semi-definition up here. Education is the business of living. Throughout our ascendant careers, we will be forever functioning as both student and teacher. The true teacher maintains his intellectual integrity by ever remaining a learner. So we need to see another one of those relationships. It's the business of living, but we are to do both. We're to be learners and we are to be teachers. And this is kind of a transitional uh, slide into our next. But Jesus said, I have taught you much by word of mouth and I have lived my life among you. I have done all that can be done to enlighten your minds and liberate your souls. And what you have not been able to get from my teachings and my life, you must now prepare to acquire at the hand of that master of all teachers, actual experience. Business of life, actual experience with what they did not learn from him a master teacher. So what can we learn about the first four ethical revelations? Planetary Prince, Adam and Eve, Melchizedek and Jesus. Education is important in each of the first, first four revelations. Two, the educational system is in step with the culture on Urantia when the revelation appears. And the third, the term education does not equate to schools. The purpose of education as portrayed in the Urantia book is much broader. And I think that's one of the reasons it's kind of so hard to pinpoint education as we're reading through the papers, because it's not always used in the same way. However, it's almost always related to culture. And that's what we have to view as we move forward with its importance and its purpose. So now we're going to look a little bit at the history of the Urantia revelation, which is grounded in the evolutionary culture of the early 20th century. And I'm focusing on America because that's where the revelation came. But it's grounded in culture. And we don't always see that because so little is um, you know, expressed in the Urantia book about itself, although it talks about Revelation. So what I want to kind of start out with, with is some historical background. Education in America during the early 1900s was changing rapidly, both in terms of its importance and purpose. And I'm going to list three factors that I believe have had the, some of the most, most affected education as the Urantia book was coming through and the culture of America was set. There was a great influx of immigrant families entering America at this time, often landing in the big cities where there were jobs. Second, the influx required an educational system of non-religious, non-private, free schools especially for children who did not speak English or understand democracy. And in some of the readings that I do, you know, you don't quite put democracy <laughs> with an educational system, but think about it. There were a whole lot of people that were coming to the United States to be able to vote, right? They were all, all became citizens and they were able to vote. So what do we see? We see democracy being one of the key areas that was attached to education during this time period. And we also see religion in America as being in transition. There was a lot of loss after World War I. 
in um, 1914 to 18, and the Spanish flu, 1918 to 1920. And it left doubts in many religious people's minds. Why didn't God answer that prayer? I prayed for my son, I prayed for my daughter, I prayed and God did not answer it. So what God is this? And I think that's kind of, you know, the beginning in this era of the decline of education, um, kind of decline of religion, because of these losses that had been sustained during the World War and the Spanish flu. There were million, how many? 50 million people lost to our planet during this time. When I go back and try to define education, as it was, as the Urantia book was being transmitted, we see um, education in three different ways in the Webster's Dictionary. So first off, they talk about education as schooling. Education suggests attending a school, and you may hold that viewpoint as well. Education is also as training. Training suggests exercise or practice to gain knowledge, skill, or physical endurance. And then we also see the last one, which is a little bit closer um, to what we're gonna find in the Arantia book, is education as a discipline. Discipline suggests training using a prescribed course of study, often related to the development of character. And where do we see most of that discipline definition? We see it in religion. Again, another tie back to what was happening at that point in time. Character development, moral development, you know, which the Urantia book really hits us on. Where are our institutions of moral development right now? And not only where are they, but also, why does the Urantia book make such a big point about morals, spirit, mind? Because that was education in the 1900s. Now there's another definition. It's actually the first definition in the dictionary was actually about mothers doing something with breastfeeding or animals being fed by something. So I, I find that interesting that education starts with mammals. But we, then our, this is our second definition. But we have a third definition in there, which is going to begin to hint at what we're going to be seeing as we look further into the Urantia book. Our third definition of religion, the totality of the qualities acquired through individual instruction and social training, which further the happiness, efficiency, and capacity for social service of the educated. As a liberal education, the education of a people is measured by its ideals and principles. Now, so, I know, it's really a very interesting definition of it, which furthers the happiness, efficiency, and capacity for social service. And for many of you who are knowledgeable about the social gospel movement, which was big during that period, where people were, especially Dr. Sadler and Lena, they were very much part of this education dealing with people that were a lot of them were immigrants that had landed in cities because that's where the jobs were. So this kind of gets us a little bit closer, not a whole lot, but a little bit closer to how the Urantia book actually talks about education. We have another, we have a kind of another movement coming off the side and that's, I'm going to just point out two in individuals. The first is John Dewey, and his, um, he wrote a book, and it was called e Education and Experience, and he promoted uh, the need for a new philosophy of education. Progressive education 
And he, he would say something like, education should promote individual growth and students for full participation in a democratic society. So we have one of the heavy hitters, probably the most prominent educators in America during the first half of the 20th century, now moving till we see kind of how it's intertwining itself with the business of education is life, is experience. We also see another, Albert Einstein, who so many of us know of for his work, but he had some interesting um, observations about education. Starts out with, education is not the learning of facts, it's rather the training of the mind to think. The second I decided I could laugh at, but it's education is what remains after one has forgotten what one has learned in school. <laughs> But the brilliant man with probably an IQ higher than, you know, most anybody, I think he could probably say that. <laughs> but he's probably right in some ways. Wisdom is not a product of schooling, but of the lifelong attempt to acquire it. So this progressive movement w that we're seeing from the time that, you know, immigration, democracy, now we're seeing education is not just for learning facts, but it is also for living life and training your mind. Education is the business of living. It must continue throughout a lifetime so that mankind may gradually experience the ascending levels of mortal wisdom. And this, there is kind of a little bit of a triad here. Continue, education must continue, it must gradually experience the ascending levels of mortal wisdom. And it is through the business of living that that occurs. So I want to transition a little bit to what education was like in the early days at 533, during the time when um, we can see the culture, because it's always grounded in culture, um, from the Urantia Brotherhood Constitution, which was originated in 1937, the, the Committee on Education shall find, prepare, and qualify teachers of the Urantia Book, who shall be persons of high moral character, devoted to the teachings and principles of the Urantia Book. It, sh it shall seek to interest such suitable persons in preparing themselves to teach the truths of the Urantia Book, and to prepare and qualify such per persons to teach the Urantia book. Now, would we say that today in our culture, I guess is a question to ask, or would this be something that is kind of far away, culturally bound in the early 20th century? And as evidence of that, we can see some pictures of the early forum days where they studied the papers. And so I'd like somebody, maybe one of my friends in the front row, if you would basically tell us what you see in that picture, both pictures, because you were supposed to be my helpers. <laughs> <laughs> Or guard, you could be helper too. <laughs> you see maps, exactly right. Chairs, and, and how are the chairs facing? The podium, yes. So what we see is what would be considered a typical, right, form of education in the early days of the Urantia movement. And again, culture. We need to see a change in culture before things like this change, although we have seats facing the podium. So I don't know, maybe it's never changed. <laughs> but it, it actually has. And that's my evidence to say to you that we're, um, you know, we're transitioning again. We are transitioning to a higher plane, and the Arantia book is there 
to help us, to motivate us, so that we can not be sitting in front of a podium um, and believing that's the only kind of education. So we have another purpose statement. The purpose of education should be the acquirement of skill, pursuit of knowledge, realization of selfhood, and attainment of spiritual values. So we enter into a little more complex definition, acquirement of skills, wisdom, selfhood, and attainment of spiritual values. So what can we learn from the history of the fifth ethical revelation, the Urantia book? Education during the early half of the 20th century occurred during a transitional time in society. And that's culture and civilization. And we'll talk about that when we get to destiny. But this is, that's so important a concept. The Orange Book is set in the culture of the time suggested by words, phrases, and contents that would be understandable to the human mind, or maybe almost understandable to the human mind. <laughs> But we notice the vocabulary and the wording is from that time period. And the word education is being redefined in the Urantia book, suggesting its higher purpose. And that to us, for those of us who have read and studied the book, it is so enlightening to see how important education is in our work. So I'm going to take us on a little bit. Now we've moved from the um, 1930, 40, 50-ish time. And now how do we view education as a society with our culture in 2024? Well, one thing we see is education has been cut into different parts. So we have different forms of education, which is a, a definite improvement from our earlier years. We have formal education, which occurs within a structured institutional framework, such as public schools following a curriculum. Then we also have non-formal education, which also follows a structured approach, but occurs outside the formal schooling system. And our last is informal education, which entails unstructured learning, through daily experiences. Anyone have a gander as to what, the, what kind of experience we have, what kind of form of education? Is it non-formal, informal, formal? Or are many, it could be all. Okay, Gard, are you gonna answer this question? Agreed. Others? No democracy, no moral development, exactly right. Okay, thank you. Well, could you say that louder though? Little arts in education, because reading and math are so important. Yes. Absolutely right. And how does that affect what's happening in terms of the viewpoint of education currently? Anyone else? Mm hmm Helen? Mm-hmm. So could you hear would you stand up, Colin, and speak to the audience?
What should I do? Oh, repeat for the streamers. Okay, you go ahead and repeat for the streamers. The, uh, because of the failure that we've seen in our educational system, a lot more parents we see now are uh, moving towards homeschooling as the uh, non-formal education and uh, where they get to control the environment of their children and they can formalize the education. And we've just seen such a growth in homeschooling. And um, they, they tried to do it with charter, school, charter schools, but then they came under the auspices of the, the local educational system. So people start to now move more towards homeschooling. Thank you. And how does homeschooling deal with socialization? How does it deal with moral development? You know, we have some of the things that the Urantia book is telling us we have got to move forward in order to move civilization forward. Mo? So a couple of breakthroughs that I think are breakthroughs is a worldwide education. The world is getting smarter and the internet is a great deal to do with it. So you can be in India and take a class at Stanford or many other types of learning that we didn't have before. And the other thing is, and I know it's more controversial, I use AI all the time. And if I want to learn something on a particular topic, I'll go and use one of the apps. And if I don't think that that is the right answer, I'll use another AI system to double check it. But I think that AI is going to be a massive learning for the world. Yes, it has. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I've got one other slide which looks at the definition of education, kind of like we looked at it. And I don't know if you agree with me, but it seems like we've made some real progress now. Education has, is the largest, in the largest sense, is any act or experience that has a formative effect on the mind, character, or physical ability of an individual. So, are we seeing a little bit closer to the Urantia book by saying it's an act or experience? And if you don't know the word formative, it means, um, it means something that grows, grows in your mind. And then we see also a second definition, education as the process by which society deliberately transmits its accumulated knowledge, skills, and values from one from one generation to another. Now, how close are we now <laughs> to the role of education in transmitting from one culture to the next? We're getting a whole lot closer because that's a big point in the Urantia book and we've got to have this transition or it all falls apart. <laughs> so, what can we learn from our current definitions of education? They've evolved greatly over time from what we saw in 1925-4. They're in alignment with some used in the Urantia book now, which they were not earlier. And the importance of education in transmitting knowledge, skills, and values to future generations is suggested in the most current definitions of education. And so that gets our, it's kind of like two parts. We know that it's uh, civilization and culture, and we also know education for personal meaning and personal growth. And the Rancho book hits on both of these aspects of education. Personal growth and civilization cosmology. Okay, I've asked Tim to help with some readings. So the next thing we're going to look at, you can't really talk about education without looking, uh, talking about mind, right? Because it is through the mind that we are educating. So next little section is going to talk about matter, mind, spirit, personality, and the gift of the cosmic mind. Well, it's Marilyn, I wouldn't uh, make comments, but now no, I feel compelled to. No. Um, I think mind gets short shrift because we tend to lump it in the category of logic and math and you know just our mechanical thinking. 
But just like so many other words in the book, you know, father, personality, spirit, the adventure book really gives us new definitions of all these terms. And mind is one of those. And there's a lot, in fact, there's a sentence that says basically everything is our mind. Uh, the total conscious and unconscious experience of a human is the mind. The total conscious and unconscious experience. So there's a lot packed in there as we read. Material mind is the arena in which human personalities live, are self-conscious, make decisions, choose God or forsake him, eternalize or destroy themselves. Education and mind with spirit are inextricably tied together. The progression of eternity does not consist solely in spiritual development. Intellectual acquisition is also a part of universal education. The experience of the mind is broadened equally with the expansion of the spiritual horizon. Mind and spirit are afforded like opportunities for training and advancement. Just that, yeah, these are two different mind and spirit. Both have to evolve. Both we're going to get evolved spirits. We're going to get evolved minds. We're going to get new minds, essentially new, although we have the core of our spirit started now. Essentially, it, you know, we become new spirits. We're going to become new minds as well. And it's a, it's a dual track. Eventually, maybe there must be a third one. But right now, we're just doing these two. Well, well material. There, there's you know, matter, mind, and spirit, right? That's right. Uh, so there we go. OK. Um, and again, we combine all these with personality now, right? Education yeah. with mind, spirit, and personality are inextricably tied together. The purpose, another one of these purpose statements, right? The purpose of all education should be to foster and further the supreme purpose of life, the development of a majestic and well-balanced personality. So, I, well, I hope a lot that in was, there. <laughs> yeah. I hope that this was interesting because I really do feel, you know, we have thought about education um, more towards just the mind, maybe training the mind, but actually it's more than that. It's the supreme purpose to develop our well-balanced personality of which we know is going to bring us onward. The pattern. Matter, mind with matter, spirit, and personality. The goal of the evolutionary universes is the subjugation of energy matter by mind, the coordination of mind with spirit, and all of this by virtue of the creative and unifying presence of personality. Personality unifying all of those being the purpose of all of those things together. Can't exist without them, but can't also exist without each one evolving to support it properly. Thank you. This was like David's very favorite quote, maybe maybe second or third, but it was way up there as the, at the top because what it helps us do, or at least I think it helps us do, is understand we are a part of this evolving culture, and we are a part of bringing together all that is good through the mind in coordination with the spirit, and we have to pay attention to personality, which has a very different definition in the Urantia book than it does in the regular vernacular. Would you like to say something, Gard? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Did right. everybody hear? Personality is the supreme revelation of God to the universe. And this is where all our power is, all our choice is, all our free will is, all of God's will, right? And aligning, creative and unifying presence of personality. He gave that to us, and we have to be creative and unifying, using it to coordinate our minds and spirits, thereby overcoming the limitations of matter energy, living forever, for one. Lots of other stuff, too. Yes, thank you. So we're going to go on to um, um, the cos cosmic mind. 
And actually, this was something very interesting to me. I think I missed it when I read the Urantia book 20 times or more, because I had notes in my book, but I had no recollection of it and the role that it actually can play in our lives, which is even more exciting. And I tried to make this interesting because it can get pretty deep, so I hope I made it interesting. It was my goal. So the fact of cosmic mind explains the kinship of various types of human and superhuman minds. Not only are kindred spirits attracted to each other, but kindred minds are also very fraternal and inclined towards cooperation, the one with the other. Human minds are sometimes observed to be running on channels of astonishing similarity and inexplicable agreement. Have any of you ever had that feeling that you have a kindred spirit somewhere, or a kindred mind, anyway? I think we pretty much all have, right? That's a part of our experience. And when we have that cooperation, and we're inclined towards cooperation, it doesn't mean we have to, but we most likely will. Um, and I, I think cosmic mind, that kinship feeling, that we all have, you know, that we all have had, is a gift. And that gift is the cosmic mind from the infinite spirit. So human intelligence is also illuminated by the cosmic mind. Intelligence grows out of a material existence which is illuminated by the presence of the cosmic mind. It is this universal cosmic endowment of will creatures which saves them from becoming helpless victims of the implied a priori assumptions of science, philosophy, and religion. So, a universal endowment, we all can access it. It's done through the infinite spirit. Has anyone had that experience of how the, do you feel like you are helpless? victims of the implied a priori assumptions or of science, philosophy, or religion? Does that like hit anyone as something that you've thought about? Yes. Some people, people who are more uh, inclined to only believe what they can see, feel, touch, weigh, measure and just completely disregard all the unseen, the spirit knowledge, and the, the spirit experience. I can see that second uh, quote uh, where the, describing that type of person. And I think that's pretty phenomenal. And um, I think we all kind of come across this in trying to share uh, information of spiritual value where some people are just, oh no, if I, you know that that's not scientific. It's it's um, it's it's not measurable. They think I, I would argue that it is very measurable. By the way, and uh, uh, but that would seem to me an example of people who are uh, victims of what this uh, quotation is describing. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. You know, in simple language, what this is saying to me is we're always threatened with a small point of view uh, and captured by a small point of view. And what they're saying is we have an inherent endowment in us that shows us the largest frame of reference and encourages us to think outside of our boxes and always be looking at something much, much larger, which we can almost feel organismically. Thank you. So, what is the cosmic mind? Through a technique of self-revelation, we recognize the reality of these three manifestations of the cosmic mind. Causation, moral duty, and worship. These three basic factors in reflective thinking may be unified and coordinated in personality development. So again, we kind of see at the top of my little drawing that isn't so pretty, that personality is going to unify and coordinate 
moral duty, mind, reason, philosophy. This is the matter section, science, matter, energy, causation. And then we also see religion, spirit, faith, worship, religious experience on that third line, just coordinate. It is the purpose of education to develop and sharpen these innate endowments of the human mind, which are causation, duty, worship, of civilization to express them, of life experience to realize them, of a religion to ennoble them, and of personality to unify them. We always get to that place, personality, which is the unification. Did you want to say something too? So, what can we learn about the relationship between mind, spirit, matter, and personality, as well as the influence of cosmic mind? The pattern of education in coordination with the unification of matter and spirit through mind supports our own development of personality. Self-reflection is important in discerning the gift of cosmic mind. And last, mind is the arena of decision-making, and we need to use it well. Okay, so the last piece we'll look at is destiny. And a, a lot of that is based on quotes, usually related to culture and civilization, because I believe that's what the, the message that they give us over and over and over again about its importance. So. Okay. Education in the enduring state. The enduring state is founded on culture dominated by ideals, and motivated by service. The purpose of education should be acquirement of skill, pursuit of wisdom, realization of selfhood, and attainment of spiritual values. A new vision of education in a new cultural society. Your should get a vision of a new and higher cultural society. Education will jump to new levels of value with the passing of the purely profit-motivated system of economics. Education and culture. Education aspires to the attainment of meanings, and culture grasps at cosmic relationships and true values in an advancing civilization. Such evolving mortals are genuinely cultured, truly educated, and exquisitely God knowing. Civilization and culture. The effort to execute knowledge results in wisdom. And when a culture has learned how to profit and improve by experience, civilization has really arrived. Knowledge can be had by education, but wisdom, which is indispensable to true culture, can be secured only through experience and by men and women who are innately intelligent. Education in an ideal society. In the ideal state, education continues throughout life, and philosophy sometimes becomes the chief pursuit of its citizens. The citizens of such a commonwealth pursue wisdom as an enhancement of insight into the significance of human relations, the meanings of reality, the nobility of values, the goals of living, and the glories of cosmic destiny. Look how important they think this is. Usually they just give three things. They, they, they couldn't they, stop. I know. Go, I don't know why they added those additional <laughs> things. We didn't, we didn't even have personality in it. Ev evolution and cultural growth. This is actually um, David's favorite, which I think I left to last. He would talk about this incessantly. And it was so interesting because I think the Granger book is right. <laughs> but it's a... It's a very far away kind of idea. Education of public opinion is the only safe and true method of accelerating civilization. Force is only a temporary expedient, and cultural growth will increasingly accelerate as bullets give way to balance. So what can we learn about the destiny? We can learn education is instrumental in advancing culture and civilization. We learn about the pivotal role of education throughout the Urantia book, and that there is a long way to go to fill before Urantia can fulfill the destiny that is so beautifully described in the Urantia book. 
And the end. The end. <laughs> <laughs>